and welcome to another DC Today, brought to you this Wednesday. We're through the midpoint of the week and kind of an odd day in markets. Um, let me just start, get the market stuff out of the way, and then I have a few other comments I want to make. Um, futures were, were down last night and into the morning, and the market opened down 250 points. And at one point, it was down not quite 450 points. So again, compared to the huge rally of Monday, Tuesday, it wasn't much, but it was down a, a decent amount. And then um, it rallied all the way back and actually at one point was up nearly 150 points. Total um, spread between the low and the high of the day was about 568 points in the Dow. That's, that's a big uh, deal of, of internal volatility. Uh, and then the Dow closed down just 40 points. And so all that uh, intraday vol and really not not a lot to show for it, up or down. So Dow was down uh, 14 basis points. The S&P was down 0.2%. The NASDAQ was down 0.25%. One comment I want to make, the 10-year Treasury yield was up 13 basis points. It had been coming down, I think it was four of the last five days, and uh, closed today at 3.75%. 13 basis points in a day moving yields higher, bonds lower is a big deal. And I think you could argue that a 13 basis point move higher in the 10 year and the market barely moving is maybe a bullish sign. I mean, the market has been so correlated to bond yields. And if indeed it is now in a position um, to shrug off bond volatility to some degree, that, that could prove bullish for equities. Certainly, nothing would be more bullish for equities than just an actual downward movement in bond yields. Uh, so we continue to to watch that and believe that to be the most uh, important correlation in the market. Energy was, again, the top performing sector. It was up 2.06% today. This is the third day in a row for energy as the top performer, which is which is not super common at all. It's not super common for any sector to be the top performer three days in a row, but particularly for energy. The bottom performer was utilities, and uh, they were hit quite quite well at uh, down two and a quarter. So uh, big upside for energy, big downside for utilities today. Oil uh, did close just over $88 a barrel. That was up about 1.7%, uh, and that was on uh, the news that OPEC Plus went forward with a 2 million barrel per day cut in targeted production. We were one, the, ru the rumors floating around were that they may go as high as a million barrels per day and, and oil had jumped on that news. Then they came out and actually doubled with the news itself. So oil now in just a matter of a week is up 12 and a half percent from that high 70s position now to the high 80s. And I would say more than a short-term oil move, there does seem to me in the news to be very clearly a huge defiance of U.S. wishes, not surprisingly at all from Russia, but from Saudi as well. And then in terms of um, the kind of price expectations in the future, if this is what Saudi is indicating as a new normal that they want to target, the ability to clear at a $90 level, obviously you could get demand to a point where volumes uh, have to come way down and prices may may drop. But if they are at a point where uh, they want to target something in the 90s, um, that, that becomes a totally different deal for the long-term expectations of profitability in the oil sector. Um, okay, moving on, a couple of quick things that are noteworthy in the news because I don't think I would be doing DC Today if I didn't mention the extraordinary feat of Aaron Judge at the New York Yankees hitting a 62nd home run on the season, um, beating Roger Maris's record from 1961 of 61 home runs. Um, obviously, we know uh, back in the steroid era, the late 90s, that Sosa and, and Barry Bonds had done more, but this is being recognized by MLB as the home run record. Incredible season from the quite fun to watch Aaron Judge. The other news I want to share is more market oriented. Um, I'm getting a lot of pop ups in the last couple hours about Apollo announcing they're going to back out of providing the financing 
on the Elon Musk purchase of Twitter. And I don't have anything to say about uh, the deal. I don't have anything to say about Tesla, about Apollo, about Twitter. That's not what we do here at DC Today. I mentioned as a news story that yesterday we shared that Musk had announced, okay, I will not go to court. I will go ahead and go through on my deal. And then today we hear at least of one of the premier lenders backing out of the financing. Is it possible? There's not enough information yet. Is it possible that that's what the new strategy is? Is say you want to go forward with the deal, avoid a court ruling, but then um, you don't get the financing and therefore you can't be compelled to close? Or are other lenders just going to pick up where Apollo left out and other lenders who are already in the cap stack ha- not announcing that they're uh, backing out of the deal? I'm just saying this is something to watch. That whole story may not be over yet. Public policy, big story circulating around the uh, the the web and it's math that we've all known anyways. I'm just reiterating it. There's no new information here other than Politico writing a story about it today. There are 33 Senate seats up every two years. I think you guys know that. There are six-year terms, and they do an election every two years. So the way the cycle goes is 33 are turning over every election. And um, 23 of the races that will be up for grabs in 2024, 23 of those seats are currently held by Democrats, and 10 are held by Republicans. So we're focused so much on the 2022 election and what could happen with the Senate because we're in a literal 50-50 tie and it could break one or two either way. I would suggest uh, the 2024 election is going to prove fascinating on the Senate. Eight of the 23 Democrats that are in those seats that would have to be running for re-election, eight of those 2023 are either undecided or actually unlikely to be running again. So you could just have an awful lot of vulnerability for the Democrat Party in the 2024 election for the Senate. But obviously, with 30-something days to go, more people are focused on this year than two years from now. Um, Quickly on economic data, the ADP private sector jobs number came in pretty much in line with expectations. 208,000 jobs last month. They were expecting 200. There, I say this every month, the ADP number is not always correlative to the BLS number, but the BLS number comes Friday, and we'll see where that jobs data is. The ISM non-manufacturing number, which is the services sector, came in at 56.7 for the month, well into expansion. It was lower than last month, but it was higher than expectation, and that's a pretty good expansion level. So you see services expanding and goods seeing their expansion slow down quite substantially divergence in the economy between services and goods. On the Fed side, there's a new Fed governor, Philip Jefferson. I believe this is the first public comments he's made since his appointment. It's the first time I've heard him since he became Fed governor. So I paid attention to his comments this morning, more or less just made a lot of comments about how much progress they're making in bringing down inflation. And so you could argue by implication, he was talking a bit dovishly, but um, Again, there's been a lot of Fed commentary over the last few days and a lot of Fed governor commentary that's happening tomorrow. And it seems to, uh, quite a mixed bag of people leaning into some, you know, uh, dovishness and more leaning into their hawkish rhetoric. And we'll see. We'll see what happens. I, I find this fascinating and I'll explain where I think it comes from. Um, we talked last week about the Bank of England had announced that they were going to intervene to support the um, British, what amount, the sovereign debt market, their 30-year long-dated bonds, what we would call treasury bonds here, um, have had collapsed in price and saw yields skyrocket higher. They said, we're going to come and do whatever we have to to intervene. And the yield has gone from 4.5% to 3.9. I mean, that's a huge drop. But they bought a grand total of 4 billion pounds of uh, in 4 billion sterling of of these bonds. So 4 billion is a lot of money for us uh, individually, but when you're about sovereign debt, it's like, you know, a lunch, a uh, snack account or something is just nothing. So how in the world do they bring bond yields down so much uh, with very little actual action? It's just the declaration of intent, the statement of support, 
the the announcement or guidance, it still matters. The the ability of a central bank when they have credibility to state an intention can and usually does with credible central banks carry uh, a self-fulfilling prophecy. What an incredible example in the last few days. I've already covered energy. That's kind of the news for the day, the markets for the day. You know, after Monday, Tuesday, when you're getting 15, 16 hundred point rallies or whatever in a couple of days, a little down 40 days seems kind of boring. But a lot of these things are noteworthy. I hope you got a lot out of it. Uh, at the dctoday.com written, I'm not going to go through it here on the podcast, but someone had sent a question in and it ended up having kind of like five parts to it. And I broke them all out as five different questions. So you got a little longer written in the DC Today. Some of the questions uh, and answers you may find interesting because people, it, it kind of leaned into some of the doomsday stuff. And what if our nation implodes? And what about hyperinflation? And what about the dollar and other stuff like that? There's a common kind of sociological thread. And uh, I have a strong heart for answering those questions with as much um, sense and and uh, conviction as I can. And I hope the, you'll look at those answers if you're uh, interested. That's all I got. Thank you for listening to and watching the DC Today. Another DC Today coming next, uh, excuse me, tomorrow, Thursday. And then of course, we'll have Dividend Cafe on Friday. Thanks for listening. Thank you for watching. Mm -hmm.